and we're live. It is Friday, August 6th, 2021, 5.03 p.m., and I am dripping with sweat from uh, one of the more uh, satisfying bits of manual labor I have done in a while. This afternoon, after my last meeting on behalf of the Lawfare Institute, I went to the hardware store and I bought a new chain for my chainsaw, my larger chainsaw. And I did this because I have discovered a remarkable fact about chainsaws that is the ultimate application of bougie first world uh, problems kind of thinking to chainsaws uh, and manual labor, which is uh, that it is actually really cheap to buy a new chain for a chainsaw. And so all this time that I used to spend manually filing, um, uh, 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 sharpening a chainsaw blade with a file, uh, now I just throw out the chainsaw blades and buy another one. So I went to the hardware store, bought a new chainsaw blade and uh, put it on the chainsaw and cut one slab of cherry wood off of my beautiful uh, piece of uh, 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 tr cherry tree stump, and um, was it like was it like a knife through butter? It well, nothing is like a knife <laughs> through butter with hardwoods, um, okay. but it went through, and there is now a beautiful slab, the entire the perfect shape of the stump uh, that is going to be one of the beds of of the table, uh, and it was. Uh, 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 immensely satisfying. So we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have new chainsaw blades that actually can cut through a slab of cherry uh, without kicking back and cutting your head into little pieces, and that's progress. Uh, so Scott, uh, please introduce our guest. Yes, um, so, um, by the way, um, I, I can I just say it was the first cut through or did was it noticeably easier? Um, um, it was. Oh, so, it, it was uh, it, unlike a chain, unlike a knife blade, a knife will still cut when it's dull, uh, mm -hmm. and you know when you're going through like a tomato, it's really the sharpness of the knife matters because it's like how much does it push before it starts cutting and does it squish it, right? Or does it just cut it like butter? Um, a chainsaw, when it's dull, will not cut anymore. Um, and it will just rub, particularly hardwoods, you can cut softwood all day, but uh, it will not actually go through it. It will just sit on it and spin and generate immense amounts of heat and it'll eventually burn it. Um, and so when it when a chainsaw is dull, it actually does not cut anymore, and uh, you have to either sharpen it or remove the blade entirely. I see. I see. So it's, uh, but but I just want to know it was satisfying. Oh, it was really satisfying. Oh, okay, okay, that's and good. The, good. And tomorrow I'm going to do another one, and I have like three beds of cherry wood that I'm creating for the three remaining. Uh, slabs of this table and it is uh, and these are big I mean this slab is like the size of my torso you know so it's it's like one cut just shaves off the surface of the uh, of the of the stump and it's uh, and it creates these very beautiful faces that are uh, you know two and a half feet long and a foot and a half wide Wow okay well that's a, do, do you um Lauren, before we introduce, before I introduce you, do you have a chainsaw and do you uh, use it? So I, I was, I'm, I'm really happy to talk about woodworking over cybersecurity. So I wouldn't talk about uh, the chainsaw, but a, about a track saw I recently acquired. Oh, it is a, oh tell us about the track saw. <laughs> <laughs> it is a <laughs> totally <laughs> hijacking <laughs> Scott. <Scott's laughs> <show here. laughs> it is a Festool TS55 and then something with RBCQ or something like that. You'll find it on their site. 
It is a lovely piece of kit. Um, it has these long tracks, so you can really kind of rip and cut um, very long pieces of wood, uh, much better so, than so, with a, so, with a so table for, saw, actually. For audience members who don't know, a track saw is basically a, a handheld circular saw that is set onto a uh, onto a kind of like a runner, and you yep. you you uh, clamp the runner to a long piece of wood, and you can ripping is the hardest kind of cut to do long cuts along the grain, and uh, a track a nice track saw uh, can take a very complicated piece of wood and and do a rip down the center of it. Um, I've never used one, but uh, I've admired them. I, I can only recommend it, um, particularly this one. It is extremely accurate. So it, it's really, you can, you can uh, set it up to like half degrees and it will not do what a lot of them do, um, which is, you know, to, the angles will not will not be uh, perfect. I'll, I'll be posting the link for anyone uh, interested. I can only recommend this saw to everyone who is interested. <laughs> well, I'll, okay, I, you know, I was really I was really worried that we weren't going to talk about track saws today, so I feel really <laughs> I feel relieved. Um, um, but but we can continue talking about this, which will. Be of interest, maybe to, to, to somebody members of the audience, but of extreme it, 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 interest to the guest it, and me. Right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. This is what we call in the law a discreet and insular minority. Um, <laughs> so, 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 I would say. So, Lauren Weisinger is a lecturer at um, at the Fletcher School. Um, of was it law diplomacy and law? Is that it? Yeah. Diplomacy and law, and he's law also. Long diplomacy. And he's also a visiting fellow, cyber fellow at Yale Law School. He was my cyber fellow, um, the uh, not last year, but two years previous. And we, I have um, Lauren reminded me that um, this is our third DefCon Black Hat together. I thought it was our second. It was our third. Um, and so the reason why I know Lauren was that um, when I first started learning about cybersecurity, I we we. We, we um, obviously like wanted to hire somebody who, you know, had a law background and a tech background. And then after the first year, I was like, no, I just want like an, I just want a system administrator, somebody who just like knows how networks work. And then um, the ISP program at uh, the Information Society um, uh, um, uh, project. Um, they got like um, um, an application from somebody who had it had really had nothing to do with law. It was like a systems administrator, but he had done a uh, PhD uh, DPhil in sociology at Oxford, and they were like, "This is Scott's guy." So they sent it to me, and I was like, "No law, that's the guy I want." Um, and so, so, I, so, but it was exactly one of the things. This is one when when my first conversation with Lauren. And I was like, how, how do I learn how to hack? How do we teach students how to hack? Do you remember what your first thing you said to me was, Lauren? Um, so I'm wondering which conversation you mean. Um, the very we first one. The phone? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, by the way, so like I call up Lauren. I'm like, I'm like the director of the Law and Philosophy um, Center. I want to hire you. It was like he was completely flummoxed. <laughs> like what? he's a sociologist from Oxford who studies cybersecurity firms and I was like the law and philosophy guy calling him up and saying he's like do you know what I do and I was like yes I do know what you do well actually one of the things that Lauren taught me was like if you want to learn about hacking YouTube you had to watch YouTube and so he too was the one that turned me on to watching YouTube videos um, like hours and hours and hours of YouTube videos because um, that's like the way that you learn um, these things but then also I would go with Lauren to various conferences and he was like Lauren's like he's, he's extremely smart and knowledgeable and has been doing this stuff for a very long time so he would like be my uh, he was like my interpreter so uh, like I would turn to him and I'd say what's this stand for and he would whisper to me so over the course of these um, o of these conferences uh, he got me up to speed and then we taught a course together with somebody else about how to how to hack and so that's one of the things I wanted to talk about 
So, hey. uh, Scott, first hey, of all, Lauren. hi, I want you to, how are you? I Good. Want you to Long notice time. Nice to see you. The almost extra <laughs> the ex quite extraordinary results of the poll that are coming in and how well woodworking tools are doing, particularly relative to inclusive legal positivism. Um, uh, so, you know, before you, you know, uh, de declare I, that nobody could possibly be interested in a discussion of Lauren's track saw, you okay, know. Okay, okay. Oh, wait, I, I, hold I, I, on, Lauren has a track saw? <laughs> Tell yep. me everything, Lauren. <laughs> okay. No, guys, it's actually really guys. funny because I was on a run and then I paused as I was coming inside and took these photos for you, Ben, because there is like literally like a guy out on like the street corner selling like all of his, t sorry, it keeps flipping, but sending all of his, selling all of his tools. He has like two, three miter saws and a grinder wow. and like a bunch of stuff. And I was like, oh, I should take these photos, sell them for like ten dollars each. I was like, I like don't know how I'm going to get them to Ben, but like I bet Ben would be interested. In I'm this. pretty well stocked mm. in in the tools department. But now I have, I can pitch them to Lauren. Is yeah, Lauren, Lauren wants <laughs> the tools. Not well stocked. Uh, guys, guys, so guys, let I, me I, know I, what's there. Just <laughs> one quick thing, guys. Can you text me when you guys want to go and talk <laughs> about hacking again? And yes. You I just can, want to point out that this you, is the original can, hacking tool right here. Um, this is a pair of bolt cutters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. All right. So uh, here is uh, to return to the subject that we were talking about. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Did you want to talk, or Ben, or did was that way way of bringing me back in? It was a way of, uh, I was going to like fake that I was bringing you back in, but then actually uh, ask a trap. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. This is with sort of a bait and okay. switch kind of move. I, but now, okay. it being a show with Scott, it becomes a meta <laughs> bait and switch <laughs> kind of move. Right. Just make sure it, that it's not a HIPAA violation. Right. I, I mean, I, I like a good, I, I like, I like good fun like the rest of the, like the rest of us. The HIPAA violations or something. Oh, by the way, like this is Lauren just got his health, what your health in, uh, network certification. So yeah. So, 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 so Lauren is certified as somebody who never violates HIPAA. Um, so is that mm -hmm. true? Um, yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, and it's also, um, it's, it's also, uh, you know, we have to think about which HIPAA it is, right? The one that's, that's like HIPPO with, with, uh, with an A that you find on Twitter or the actual law, which uh, is spelled very differently. <laughs> so I, I the, the certification I did, and I worked in, in healthcare, uh, information security and informatics for a long time, um, it does, it does deal with, the, the uh, HIPAA law more more than what you will find uh, on Twitter, and it comes with the lovely uh, acronym of um, HCISPP, and it's uh, sanctioned by ISC2, which is one of the kind of professional associations that, that deal with cybersecurity uh, stuff. So okay. I did that this summer because I had nothing better to do, obviously. <laughs> right, so yeah, so Lauren um, in his free time gets additional certifications. <laughs> which um which i just want to say makes me look a little less weird so i like that <laughs> um, um so, so Lauren, let's uh, can we, can we, so one of the things that um um w i want to talk about our class together that we taught at the law school about how to hack um, but i also want to mention that one of the things that ben um has um talked to me about um is about kind of recreating the the course as a kind of a, a public course that would be hosted by lawfare but to do it in the way in which that in the way in which in lieu of fun is kind of, the, the show works that is like we would actually have um, uh, an audience and we would teach them and all the things that fail like because when one of the things that we could talk about is that when 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 we would do live 
things in class because so we everything was like hands on, Every, like things failed all the time, and it kind of I thought having a class where you know things were failing all the time would be less interesting than one in which would be edited. So um, so Ben had I think Ben's uh, it's such a good idea to have us teach like as squares, but then having we'll see um, you know when we bring the audience in that is actually a very participatory um, thing so it like as opposed to having lectures where like a YouTube video and guys just talking at you you have a kind of interaction between the the people teaching the course us and the members of the audience so anyway I think that's such a cool and interesting idea that Ben had and that would be yeah uh, and you could use share your screen really effectively in that context right right like I mean so this is so I don't, so this is just kind of a side note and I wonder if this is true of hacking. So this is like, I don't want to, sorry, I also don't want to like take over. I just have a question related to that. Uh, no, okay. As long as you're, not, I mean, we've already oh, had about people. Okay. Right, right, exactly. There is a whole <laughs> question now about your favorite saw. Um, oh, oh uh, in case, you know, you um, have an opinion about that. That in was in case you suggested, want to go off suggested by the again. Greek chorus. Okay. Um, that was good. Uh, <laughs> my my question was based. So one of the things that's super interesting and uh, is a criticism of engineering tests general or coding tests generally when you have to like do a coding interview. So John does a lot of coding interviews for people, um, and one of the problems is that they used to be in person, and you'd have to go and code out on a whiteboard, which is a very kind of unnatural way of coding and kind of gets like kind of it's like writing out your essay on a whiteboard, like instead of like writing it on a computer. So like anyways, one of the upsides about doing so about like the pandemic is that all like very, very lengthy interview processes have gone into this like and now people code live like using their computers. And so it's like actually been supposedly much more indicative of like how people code and whether people are like kind of just like because sometimes you could be really good at like you could get really well practiced at writing on a whiteboard and not be that great a coder but like or vice versa right but like so anyways I just thought it was kind of an interesting that that's a good that that's such a that's such a good point because I, I I've had this thing where I I've like lost the ability to spell when I'm writing on a whiteboard or a blackboard. Like I remember writing the word both, B O T H, and like thing, and I would say both. Both doesn't sound like a word. Like say it to yourself, both. It like it, and so like when you write on a blackboard, it it, it doesn't look like real writing. Yes, so I mean, like, I, it's I, like I think, why people transpose words like letters all the time, and like yeah. Totally. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Anyways, I just like, I was thinking that like what you're, if you did Ben's idea and did this class, it would also just be a very natural extension of like the skills yeah. that people would have to use to interview now. So. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah, that's, that's, that's a, actually a great point. I mean, so one of the things, let's just talk about, maybe you could just mention to, um, uh, to explain to us all like um, how, how, did the class work like um you know like what 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 skills did the class try to teach and do you think certain things were successful um um in in this in this in, in this endeavor so i i think we were very successful um that's <laughs> sure. um and i'm not i'm not saying this for for, for just uh, jokes and fun but um uh, I know of various students we had who really enjoyed it, and some uh, some took this took this further. Actually, kind of used this as, as a little bit as a, a jumping off point. Um, and I think also our uh, kind of feedback from students was was uh, uh, very good. Um, and I think what what, it, what really was interesting for us. Uh, so we were a team of three, obviously Scott, um, right. uh, Sean O'Brien, who who's not here, right. and and myself, and um uh, when you start with a group of people where you really uh, cannot assume anything about their knowledge their skills in, in in technology and you want to bring them from zero to actually being able to do um a little bit of a, of a hack as a final project like christmas uh you really have to think about kind of what do you teach them how do you tell them about it and how do you scope 
um, the the kind of exercises, the difficulty, how do you balance kind of theory with, with practice? Um, because some stuff, right, is really interesting, but it's very hard to sh show in a classroom, particularly to people who, you know, have, have never looked at, for example, a, a, a terminal window before in their lives. So, and I, I think what we what we tried to do is we, we started, um, um, Scott was uh, really into, into this part, so this was um, mainly um, uh, him uh, doing that, um, talking about the, the real basics, like what, what's a processor, right? Like how, what is kernel space and user space? You really establish that. But we always try to add a little bit of a practical session in the end. Um, so things like, oh, how do you hide a file in your file system? How do you find the file? How can you set permissions so that only your user um, can do things? And we uh, set these up in a fun way for people. So essentially, uh, files were hidden on the, uh, uh, their systems, and they could kind of figure out over time a story. Um, I, I can't remember how it ended. Um, it is a few years ago. But it, it, it was essentially, we, we set up this story of um, people doing, doing stuff, and they could kind of figure it out by kind of following uh, through with the exercises. And then um, we got more and more advanced, essentially. One of the projects we did was the, um, what was it called, the pumpkin pie, um, yeah, which involved yeah. hacking a Raspberry Pi, so a small computer, um, that we put into um, Can you just explain a what a Raspberry Pi is for those? Oh, yeah, it's, like a, yeah. it's a very transformative tool, and I think a lot of people might not know what it is because it sounds like yeah. a dessert. <laughs> <Like, laughs> <So, laughs> it really does, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll go a little bit further than saying it is a small computer. So it's it's essentially a kind of, as I said, like it's a small computer. It, it has networking. It has USB, all the kind of creature comforts you, you would expect. Um, it was created as an educational tool, but you will actually find it now being used by a variety of people for a variety of tasks, um, be this, um, you know, ser be this a little server in their home network or to uh, control um, their, their tools or whatever else. So, so it actually is much more than an educational tool by now. Um, but for us, this was really useful because the Raspberry Pi is a small. Um, they run standard Linux, um, so pretty pretty easy to deal with. Um, they connect to your home network and they're cheap. Um, I think right now, probably an up-to-date one is maybe like $80. I'm sure you can get uh, some, some for cheaper. And um, so this was uh, really fun because, for example, for this project, um, we added um, some LEDs, which you can get online because people do a lot of fun things with the Raspberry Pis. So it had like a kind of fake fire effect for, for Halloween. And the task the student has was to kind of get into the Raspberry Pi and um, change um, the color um, of, uh, of, of the flame. And obviously, I kind of left some documentation on there. So that's so um, cute. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, awesome. yeah, actually, I put it. I put a. I put the. I link just pulled in it the, up. I'm gonna yeah, link yeah. to it again, uh, Scott, in case people yeah. missed it. Yeah, they actually boing boing did a story about um, about. Did the Corey class. write this up? Yeah, Corey. Yeah, yes. Cool. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. He's yeah, so, so good at picking out things and highlighting like interesting little projects. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, um, this yeah, is great. I, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was actually. I, so yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, I wanted to just add, if you ever want to do this, um, Sean, our third person who isn't here, put it on GitHub so you can just um, take whatever I did and, and then just use it first. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so here's the uh, question. I, How yeah. would this course be different if, say, you did it on Crowdcast uh, with a live audience uh, with the idea that the uh, results would live as a sequence of of YouTube videos. I mean, just imagine hypothetically, not like I'm workshopping an idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. Scott, do you want to start? Um, uh, um, um, so, 
Actually, no, you go. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. <laughs> so, um, I... I feel the first thing uh, would be right that the use of Raspberry Pis probably wouldn't be um, that that functional in that case. Um, however, um, for for our second year, we actually moved away from Raspberry Pis to virtual machines, um, and there are tools where you can run virtual machines locally on on your computer. Uh, they're they're for free, right? It's it's available. Um, and for example, one thing that could be done is to prepare images for people with, with like the exercises and everything included that they can download and then essentially run a computer virtually on, on their machine to, to try out the things. If something breaks, no problem, you just download the image again and you essentially have a fresh computer. So this was actually one of the issues we had when we gave students the Raspberry Pis because they were extremely good at breaking them. And um, <laughs> <laughs> um, on a software level, right? So they didn't drop them. But they broke the software or the operating system, and, um, and then we had to kind of, you know, uh, take them back in and, and put put it put it on again, right? Making making sure making sure they work. And with the virtual machines, it was much better because we essentially told them, look, if you break it and it doesn't start anymore, delete the old one, go to whatever solution we used, Canvas, uh, right? Download it again, and it will just work like the first day. So uh, our support calls were really reduced once we moved there. And that's, I think, what I think would be the first step when, when moving this um, to YouTube is to give people the possibility to kind of try these things out on, on their own machine without the requirement to buy kind of any hardware and to make it simple so that in case anything goes wrong, like they have a simple way to restoring it. Right. Yeah. I think, I think, I think that's right. I, I think that one of the big challenges is going to be, um, um, like it always is in, in the, in these kinds of classes, which is how to deal with it on the fly. So I really want to mention, and Lauren has mentioned this twice. I want to mention again. So we, um, Lauren, um, Sean O'Brien, who runs the privacy lab at Yale and I, we all three, um, developed the course together and Sean's not, uh, Sean hopefully will be part of this too. But one of the things that was really important when we had the class and we, 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 we kept it to 18 people, still anybody was teaching class, like we had to like go around the room helping mm -hmm. people with some kind of mess up because things always got messed up. So I think one of the big questions is whether like using breakout rooms, for example, like something is wrong with the uh, computer. Can you like signal an instructor to go to a breakout room to help fix it? I don't, I don't know if those things like will work. We'll just have to see how, how you know, like I, I'm sure the, uh, it, it'll be a work in progress. Um, uh, can I, can I, can I, um, can I say one thing, which the only thing that kind of worries me about it is um, just one of the things that is really kind of surprising is how after after not that much time how much trouble you can cause um and that was in some sense kind of scary so what would happen was um by christmas time i mean it was it, they 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 had to start it before christmas but for the final project they had to do three different hacks and um and they were, you know, there was like a lot of innovative type stuff that people did. They were hacking um, their own, they were hacking their own routers. They were trying to hack toasters. They were trying to hack Roombas. They were trying to do a lot, a lot of different things and they were successful at a lot of it. But the thing is, is that ordinarily level headed, like super um, ethical and responsible students like had the most harebrained ideas about what they thought that they could do compatible with the law so they were like saying for my project what, what i'm trying to do is hack my uh partner's um uh um computer at his law firm and i'm like no <laughs> you, you you may not do that that is I mean, like, first of all that's a good way to get a divorce <laughs> I mean, there, there's so many bad, like, there's so many bad things. But the thing is, like, 
you know, it's like if you if you teach somebody how to use a hammer, they're just going to go around knocking things. And so the problem is, at least with the students, you could say over and over again, like, please, really, this would be a violation of federal law to do this on the Internet. Do yeah. not do, do this. Do not. It's a HIPAA violation. No, it's never, it's never, well, <laughs> I wouldn't. Like, you know, like those little plastic hammers that you give little babies because they yeah, right, right, smash right, it right. into everything. Right. This is why you only give them re- like, like, like raspberry pies, and then you also control the battery, like the plug, right. <laughs> to, like, yeah. pull them out but, of the. But I figure, I figure, if we put this on the on the open internet, if we put like a little kind of um, notice that say, "Do not violate the law," I'm sure it'll um, be fine. That would be it, fine. That's plenty. Well, because the section <laughs> two thirty, section two thirty means that you can't be held responsible for anything that happens on the internet. And um, the privileges and immunities clause. Yeah, I, and, I, and when <laughs> section, and when section two thirty yeah. and HIPAA collide, yeah. uh, that's like you know you don't want to be there. Yeah. 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 Um, All right. Let's bring in, uh, it's time for some audience questions. Can I take uh, this class from you guys? Could I audit this? Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. I'm an absolutely. affiliate at Yale in some weird capacity. <laughs> like, uh, no, we are doing. Uh, John Hawkinson, the floor is yours. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask about the wisdom of some of these uh, computer numeric controlled conversions of tools because when we talk about hacking and it can mean a lot of things but for you guys it seems to sound like it means automation of hardware at a kind of not super complicated level so i i wanted to know i I have a compound miter saw that sitting sits in my basement and i don't use it a whole lot but, but i thought what if we could do a cnc conversion of it and it doesn't have many degrees of freedom uh i mean i guess it has four um, and, and maybe it should get an X table on its on its regular table so it could slide the wood because if it's just making automatic cuts, I don't know if that's that's good. But I worry about the safety, especially if, if anyone other than me might use it. I, I live in an apartment building and my basement is not super secure. So, you know, would, there, would I have liability problems if some of my neighbors went down and broke into my storage space and tried to use my CNC controlled compound miter saw? So, so that's really my question. Yeah, um, Lauren? Uh, uh, Lauren. I'm not the lawyer. <laughs> Don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> just, I mean, but I, I mean, like, there's technical aspects of this question. Uh, should you hack a table saw or a miter no, saw? No, a compound uh, miter saw. Yeah, no, should you hack a compound miter saw and, uh, and make it CNC controlled? I mean, I am aware that uh, actually people do this. People all the do time. this, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it sounds extremely cool. So you know, when I when I move into a house with a basement um, and I have enough room, I would love to have a Raspberry Pi controlled saw down there. Now I think that the thing with that is you should make sure that no one apart from you who knows how to deal with this thing is touching it and potentially hurting themselves. Yeah, maybe password so, control the on-off switch. Pa- <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like lock the door. I don't think it like that. Like I that. think like you get a lock. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, like, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I want to add something to this point, which is that there is a whole world of awesome CNC controlled tools. Um, and um, particularly in the router department, people do awesome things with, uh, with CNC um, and wood. Uh, there is also, I've done some CNC wood burning, which is uh, freaking fabulous. Um, and um, uh, I, assume, I assume CNC stands for command and control. Or no? No. <laughs> um, okay. Well, commander in chief? No. 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 What, what, what it does it stand for? It's a. Uh, it's a. It, it's a. It's a protocol. Cookies and cream. It's a protocol for <laughs> three-dimensional uh, uh, sort of vector graphics controlled uh, mm-hmm. uh, physical uh, robotics in space. It's the protocol okay. used for three D printers. Uh-huh, um, it's also used for uh, laser engraving, um, and it's also used for 
you know, if you imagine a very fast spinning thing that's on a three-dimensional axis, you can cut into wood with it, right? And and if it's fine enough, you can you can do incredibly refined engravings or uh, three-dimensional uh, carvings. Um, I, I don't remember what it stands for, um, but uh, here's the thing about it. Um, and I mean, John uh, is, I assume, joking with the question. Um, these are really powerful tools and they generally involve very sharp blades spinning very quickly. Uh, and so actually, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, probably best not to try it. Um, and, um, you know, I, I've always, you know, the, the, the story with, you know, with, uh, um, uh, 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 remote driving, right, and, and driverless cars, where it's dramatically safer than operating a car until the moment that it's not, right, <laughs> is really true of a saw. Um, and, you know, the human brain and the human, the two human hands are, uh, except Kate's, of course, um, <laughs> with Kate, Kate's brain is fine, but the hands, like, she just cuts them a lot. Um, you know, they're actually well-trained humans are, are still going to be much better at this than, than, uh, than AIs. Yeah, I mean... So, so to bring this back to to hacking, I, I, um, right? The the thing is with um, with CNC equipped tools, right? This is one of these things where um, a right, if you do it wrong, you can actually make your CNC kind of cut itself. That is totally possible if you aren't careful. Um, and <clears throat> What is that I'm murder or suicide more? if that happens? <laughs> I want, like, I'm from a sure. legal perspective. Uh, <laughs> why am I being asked to legally? <laughs> there are lawyers on this call. Uh, no, no, no. The, the, the basic principle here is, is that, like, whenever we have a legal question, we ask Ben. <laughs> and the, 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 not, well, Ben's on mute. We ask Lauren. No, right. I mean, no, yeah, so what I wanted to get to, right, is that we really have this um, issue now when we talk about kind of cybersecurity and things like that, that people do connect their CNC to the internet because, right, I'm, I'm upstairs in my living room and I'm cutting some wood downstairs. So I do want to see what's going on and maybe kind of um, do that. And that that's me, but you also have this uh, with the power plant, your local utilities in general. They connect stuff to the internet um, that really has a direct impact on, on people's lives. Might this be, right, your, your water supply and what goes into it, or might this be some critical internet infrastructure that is not immediately related, but that is required to run these processes. And once it goes down, you're in, you're in big trouble. So that's, I think, just, just like as a side note to kind of bring this back to hacking, right, this is why this matters and matters m more and more because there's close to nothing that isn't connected in some way, shape, or form, and therefore vulnerable. Yeah, that, I mean, That's I think like the big really great point. Yeah, right. I think that it, it's um, cybersecurity is being it's such a, a huge thing because so many people are connecting their cable saws to the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it's better than like a thirteen-year-old playing war games. Like, I think. <laughs> Is it? I don't know. <laughs> Until the table saw cuts your hand off because someone hacked your Raspberry Pi. Right, or right. then, like, the saws are dangerous. Or enough. then gets and then like, just... you mount it. I got it, guys. We mount a table saw on a self-driving car and then just like send it down <laughs> the street. That seems, yeah. just to see if we can, guys. No, no, we're just gonna gray hat it. We're just gonna like see if we can do it. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think we need the liability lawyers now. <laughs> just put it, do it on the, film it, put it on the internet, section 230 will protect you. 
Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> so the show, the, the Greek chorus is reminding us of BattleBots. Yes, that is. I like just want to say, <laughs> BattleBots was the greatest show so ever, um, and I really think it should be brought back. Paula, what? what, what? Go, go ahead. You Paula. never saw BattleBots? No, I never saw BattleBots. Oh. Uh, this just, is something you can also learn about from yeah, YouTube. Yeah, just go look it up on <laughs> yeah, YouTube. It's lovely. It's, okay. it's a wonderful thing. It's, it's kind robots. of like, it's basically robots with power tools attacking each other. It's uh, okay. bringing together it's like, all the themes of this show. And they, they just destroy each other. And then they're just so, like, whether you go all defense and make this, like, basically impenetrable fortress that can't attack anyone, or whether you decide to be, like, a total, like, offensive attack monster, but makes you very vulnerable to tipping over or, like, becoming, like, completely I, I unable love to. That. My it's favorite, super interesting. My favorite battle bot was just a wedge on wheels. And it would yes. ram the other ones and come up underneath them and flip them over. Um, oh, what was the that. name of that one? I, I don't remember. It was, it was awesome. BattleBots was the greatest show. Paula, the floor is yours. Do you have a table saw question <laughs> oh my yeah. God. for yeah, our I, guests? I have two questions. You know, I'm a young person, um, and I've cut myself several times with a potato peeler. So I'm wondering what kind of saw would be great for someone who doesn't want to spend money on all this furniture for my new apartment, right? No Get saw, a no saw. Get yeah, a butter right. knife, Paula, and a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> so, you, you would be surprised how many woodworkers have lost fingers. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Um, in <laughs> table <laughs> saws, yeah. they are Kate dangerous. <laughs> so I've terribly really, scared to death of them. If you, I would avoid them. They're they're really scary, actually. <laughs> you have to imagine you have a spinning blade like this size on top of a table that you're standing in front of. And, you're, and that you're strapped through. down on the train track <laughs> as the blade comes down toward you. And you're just pushing this long thing in and you're like got a little jig so you can push it all the way in. But like it kind mm -hmm. of like starts to like buckle and do something weird. And you're like, oh, I'll just like reach my hand in a little bit further to make sure it stays down. And then you're like, no, no, that's the trap. Anyways, don't use a table saw. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But it can get more no. dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> And so the least a lot of what happens is also kickback. So you actually get hit by the piece you're working on, which is the far more common injury, in fact. Um, yeah, don't yeah, do it. A, that's also the issue with chain, uh, the, the issue with chainsaws as well is kicks. Is that it bucks back. It bucks back, yeah. Yeah. but then it's the blade that's bucking, not the, not the target. Right. Would. Yeah. But it if would. I gave up a couple of fingers for a couple hundred dollars and a visit to Ikea, would that <laughs> no, this no. is the whole beauty of Ikea. No, it's just you don't need a fucking saw for anything unless you've really fucked up. Here's a <laughs> dirty little secret. Good woodworking is much more expensive than buying furniture. Right, I guess um, that's right. It's yeah. um, because, you know, you're dealing, you don't have the economies of scale and all those, you know, uh, underpaid workers. And you have to buy the uh, materials and you pay retail for them. And so you think you're gonna save money by doing it yourself, but like I'm making this conference table for Lawfare, it would be way cheaper to buy it. Um, <laughs> and I'm using wood that was downed in my neighborhood in DC. So and don't think you like, save it. Goes for nine dollars an hour. So like, yeah, exactly. Not I a pay lawyer. myself shit. <laughs> I <know. laughs> so I have a question about um, <laughs> hacking, um, which is, how do you keep up? Um, because it seems to me that in to hack well you actually have to be a little bit ahead of the technology, which is to say you have to understand what they've done and what they haven't done and where the seams are. And they have whole teams of people doing this and you have to study and be ahead of them. And this is these fields, both on the hardware side and the software side are moving super, super fast. So like, how do you actually, actually stay ahead enough to enough that your sense of where the seams are 
uh, are accurate in a timely fashion. Mm. You're you're the guest, Lauren. Okay, so I will I will start. Um, so, in I will answer in a weird way. Um, so one of the things I, I work on right now and I, I write quite a bit about is exactly uh, the complexity uh, problem, right? And and um, the issue is that essentially the way we do things right now, we do essentially cannot. It is far too specialized. Um, in this space to really have, you know, like a deep insights into all the required um, uh, kind of areas of the technology stack and more so kind of the technology network, right? Because we're not just building stuff kind of on top of hardware anymore, but we're using complicated cloud products, pulling data and services from a variety of places. So essentially it is getting harder to kind of know about everything that is that is going on. It was always hard, um, but now we're, we're, we're getting to the point where our architectures are, are hard to understand. We were just at a talk, um, Scott and I, yesterday or the day before, I'm not 100% sure, um, where some researchers talked about um, AWS and how they could read from um, virtual machines um, in AWS using tools provided by Amazon. So so they, um, because what, what Amazon um, did there was that they did not limit um, what certain services they offered could, could access. So the assumption by the people owning um, these, these buckets, users, whatever, was that this was private. This was limited um, to um, their own uh, kind of, you know, services, their own systems, if you will. Um, however, what, what actually happened is that some of these services worked globally and people were not aware that this was the case. And this is one of these examples where it's not even um, just about technology, but it is really about how did, for example, my cl cloud hoster set up these systems and they change things all the time. So you have to kind of keep track of everything um, that's like that's like going on in this space. So you have a cloud vendor, you have hardware running, you have operating systems running, right? Everything is moving, uh, all the goalposts are shifting and you're um, kind of, mm, you know, unable to kind of follow all of this, which I think will become a bigger issue. As I said, I'm, I'm uh, well, uh, writing on this quite a bit right now. Yeah, well, one of the things that, uh, so what Lauren is pointing out here is so the talk that we were at, so like, let's say you have a couple of accounts on on the cloud that you're, let's say you're, you rented um, Amazon's cloud services, AWS, Amazon Web Services, and you have a bunch of these accounts that you're running on the cloud and you and 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 um aws amazon provides you this service called cloud trail that goes and it it tells you what your accounts are doing and one of the things that they what they show what the what the presenter showed was that the permissions that were given to cloud trail was that it could read and write to various accounts, but didn't say who could do it. So basically anybody could do it. So one of the things I think that, that Lauren is pointing out is that not only is it like, it's getting super hard for hackers to like know the technology themselves, it's like getting super hard for Amazon to actually make the, the services mm -hmm. that they're making um, um, in a way where um, actually you're the only one who can control your account. Um, so it's it's like it things are so complicated that even the the cloud designers, cloud engineers, can't even do things um, correctly, um, and it's yeah. it's actually a huge problem. Um, as they were showing, is that there's like misconfigurations all over the cloud, um, and so lots of times people think, and, and for good reason, that like they should use the cloud because the cloud is really um, the people who are you who are managing the cloud like they do security you know that's their job and so they're really good 
at this. It just so <laughs> happens that it's so complicated that they're misconfiguring these things for everybody as well. So that's kind of interesting. David Botts, who has been Alice. Speaking of, where's um, Alice been lately? Has anyone seen Alice? Alice has abandoned us, I think. Um, Alice, if you're out there. We miss you. Um, I'll text we her. We miss you. Uh, come back. Uh, David, walk, you're wonderful, walk into wonderful the light. stand in but, for, for but, Alice. But we love David Botts, too. <laughs> uh, and David, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you. This is uh, uh, super interesting and um, uh, really glad, uh, Scott. I'm not going to ask you how do you, I'm not going to ask you how you feel about being in Las Vegas. That would be wrong. So I'll ask you about and, and, how and you that, about, like that would be a HIPAA violation. <laughs> right. So how do you feel about being on Pacific time? Again, you you said, "How do you feel?" That's a HIPAA violation. Okay, okay. so I'm um, going too far. All right. No, no, I think the, yeah. way, the, the, the way to do it. Uh, first of all, you can't ask questions about how anything about how you feel. You right. Say, so you can't do do that. you have reflections on being in Pacific time? On- I, I, I would, I would, I, I think that that's. Um, I, I'll, I'll let that go because it's Friday, um, and it's cheese night in, in ish. theory ish ish um so i'll let that go i will say that i am still on eastern coast time so i went to sleep at like eight thirty last night and i got i keep on getting up at four thirty in the morning i would just um, point out that if we had universal time uh we wouldn't up, have man. to make be making all these <laughs> references yeah that doesn't right. make any uh, sense okay sorry <laughs> so um <laughs> Uh, Lauren, you've been a fabulous guest. Um, you, in, in spite of in spite of all of the circumstances that you are now in, um, what are your thoughts about how integrated integrated circuits and internet connectivity have created additional vulnerabilities, up to and including power tools? Yeah. And, and I've got a great example right. of a power tool problem. <laughs> and now we're talking. Um, so, so essentially, I think one aspect that I kind of talked to already, right, is this, is this complexity aspect, right? You connect more and more stuff, it gets harder and harder to actually figure out what is where, what is doing what, what is talking to what, who is in control of what, right? Who can patch it, maybe, who knows? Um, so that, that's definitely one. The other part is that a lot of the kind of IoT systems, so I'll just I'll just call it right. Um, we have power limitations, um, but um, more so, we just usually want really cheap hardware, which means it's often hard to really include security properly, um, and it's even harder to patch some of this stuff. So, so if it's vulnerable, it will stay vulnerable. Um, and as we know, a lot of these things will, will connect to the open internet, which means, well, this is now open for, for botnets. This is now open for um, some some form of exploitation in, in, in general. Um, and it, the danger really, can, again, coming back to complexity is when, when you have that and everything is talking, um, it, it gets harder and harder to kind of figure out what is kind of OK and, and what isn't. And now talking about power tools. So um, there are a variety of vendors that will let you connect um, to your power tools via Bluetooth, for example. So Bosch Professional, um, the the blue ones, you can connect with your phone uh, via Bluetooth to your tools. So just as an example, right? Russian interference in the woodworking of (laughs) general (laughs) contracting. (laughs) Yeah, think think about this. You have a senator who loves woodworking, and then their table saw is 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 getting hacked um, while they're you know building a boat um, in in their basement, and and it does something, and you know it's 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 successful. I mean, this sounds completely crazy, yes, um, but at the same time, considering what we're doing and what we're connecting, um, it might not be as crazy in a few years from now. But, but like really briefly like can i just say that this is that's not anything new about modern technology generally which is there's a trade off between connectivity and convenience and safety mm-hmm. and like and vulnerability like this is true of like 
if you have it, if you allow your browser to save your password, you don't have to type your password in every time. But it means that also, like, if you're anyone ever takes your computer and wants to get into your email, they can get into your email if they have your computer. Like, it's not like there are like there are very. I mean, that's one example. But basically, like the idea being that if there's some type of way to connect, connect various devices, it means that it is another portal in which to exploit for like a safety or a vulnerability measure. And that like the more you add to those or you create lack, like you remove friction around those connectivities, like by enabling Bluetooth versus a, a cord, right? Like, or like, or something physical, then you're going to have, uh, you're going to have like different types of security vulnerabilities and they're, or they're going to increase in my opinion. But so, yeah. but, so. but is, can you identify a general rule like, I cannot imagine a good reason for a thermostat to be internet connected. Sure there um, is. There's tons of good reasons for a thermostat to be in internet connected. Like you're what? traveling, you're traveling and you have like, you have things like you, you, you know, you live in an area with like a lot of vulner, like a lot of like a uh, very um, up and down kind of. Isn't that what uh, neighbors are for? Yeah, but people don't always have neighbors Turn then. Like my some people live so like. That my, Pipes don't freeze. No, no, no. That's not like, I'm sorry. That's like actually like a lot of people don't have good neighbors they can trust to do that. I mean, I've never mm. spoken to my neighbors and I've lived in this building for 12 years and they have like five <laughs> feet that way. So there's like, I mean, like, I mean that, I mean, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I know my neighbor were very, okay. very like, sweet, let, let me like, frame, yeah. let me frame it a different way. Um, can you identify a heuristic rule that identifies when something big or small is too critical to connect. Um, so like, okay, I'll accept Kate's point. I can ident she can identify circumstances that a thermostat should be internet connected. But I look at my house and I say, I don't really want the Russians to be able to control the temperature in my house. And um, uh, when, like, there has to be a, a a kind of mental algorithm that we can use. Why do you think the Russians would try to control the temperature in your house? Why do you think they give, like, a flying fuck what the temperature is in your house? <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't have thought that 10 GOP was uh uh would have been a good idea for the russians either but they did that and i just don't think the added convenience of having a toaster that you know i can say you know from my bedroom time to make toast now is worth the um value of having somebody able to say time to burn down Ben's house now heat up <laughs> you know for and, as much as you uh, possibly can so I, I just want to jump in right um, quick point on, on the last thing right it's not necessarily that you are hurt by it but others and society might so for example your smart thermostat if it's badly secured might be taken over by a botnet might be used for a variety of phishing scams, whatever else. And that is not hard to do in a lot of cases. So there is that aspect. Uh, but I wanted to come back to the um, saving passwords. Indeed, if you use Firefox, um, that browser as a kind of um, password saving feature has been externally audited. So in fact, um, if you use a very strong password for that and you save things, in your browser, you will probably be better off than typing it in. In particular, if you use random number generation on these passwords, so you only remember one very complicated passphrase, um, go to XKCD for, for uh, examples how to do this, um, and then you just use random numbers for all, for all your accounts, your browser will remember it, they will be encrypted. So if someone steals your laptop, without your very long and complicated passphrase, that's very important, obviously, when you're securing uh, dozens of passwords, uh, it will be very hard for an attacker to do this. Even better, use um, something like KeePass, 
um, my favorite password manager because it, it runs locally. Um, I am not a fan. I'm just saying of, of the of the of the services. I would say right, it's much better than 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 remembering right and using something that is easily doable or reusing passwords. For passwords, I like to stay local. That's why I recommend KeePass. Usually, right, you'll be fine with any of the commercial options too. Don't get me wrong. Um, just my personal preference. So I just wanted to say that regarding the passwords, you might be better off actually saving um, and and kind of use random random uh, things there that are not reused because that is one of the key ways that attackers actually get to your passwords, right? They look at the kind of password you have on one site that got breached, and then they have your email address, right, or whatever uh, you use to log in, right? Plus a password you use elsewhere, it's probably reused because humans do not remember things like that very well. Um, so then you'll have it somewhere else in there in, in, in your next account. Um, also for anything that matters, and I will end the security advice there, enable two-factor authentication and pr preferably not something that uses um, text messages or SMS. Use security keys um, or at least um, uh, kind of uh, the systems where um, it, it generates codes on, on your phone that you uh, then type in so that the OTP um, stuff. So that's that's my recommendations on that. Uh, so, sorry for jumping in, but I thought it was important to underline this. Yeah, absolutely. So before we wrap up, David Botts, you said you had uh, a great example of your point, and uh, then we started answering your question before you had a chance to give it. So give your example. Well, thanks. So there's a there's a security researcher named Monte Elkins, and I put it into the chat. He uh, he he took a drill with integrated circuits, and he reprogrammed it so that it can play um, the the theme from Darth Vader and Star Wars mm -hmm. um, in a drill because all of these things with integrated circuits it's all programmable. And so even if it is not literally connected to the internet or connected via Bluetooth or what have you, so many of these things run on software. Software is written by humans, humans are imperfect, and software can also be changed. So it can be, life can be super interesting with programmable logic controllers in power tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, on that note, I've got good news and bad news for you. I'm going to give you the bad news first. The first bit of bad news is that we are out of time and we got to wrap up. Uh, the second bit of bad news is your power tools are not safe. Uh, <laughs> the hackers are coming for your power tools. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but here's Work. the good bit of news. Uh, Scott and I hope Lauren are going to teach the hacking course on Lawfare Live. So cool. We're, we're going to create a set of videos uh, <laughs> uh, so that you too can be one of the people that hacks the power tools in addition to one of the people who gets your power tools hacks, hacked. You can't actually do yeah. anything about that. that but I do think power tool security is the future and we all have to start working on it. No, that's right. I mean, we're, our, our motto for the class is be part of the problem. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. right, if the, if the Russians e have either a perpetrator that, or a victim. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's the thing. If the Russians hack your thermostat and it's gets getting really cold in winter, you can get back at them that's by right. that's right hacking right. power tools. So they'll be that's... really annoyed all the time. Right, or by turning <laughs> up your thermostat. Um, to the desirable <laughs> level. It is, it is their track tools, their track saw, <laughs> that, you know, they think it's going to uh, cut a perfect joint over a long distance, and it's going to be just because of your intervention, like a fraction of a degree, a few degrees off, mm. so that when they put the two pieces of wood together, there'll be this annoying gap. Um, and all, you know, all the wood putty in the world will not fix a, a five degree off angle. Um, yeah. uh, and so that's what we're aspiring to here. 
Um, fuck up yeah. the Internet Research Agency's power tools. We are going to leave it there. Uh, Lauren, uh, I don't know what nationality you are, but, you know, you're I was going to say we usually say you're a great American to our guests, but I don't really know if you are American. You're a great temporary resident of Las you Vegas. You seem suspicious. Um, <laughs> um, suspicious. Um, uh, we will be back on Monday. I don't know who our guest is going to be. I but do. It, you do? Oh. Yes, I have the entire week booked. Um, oh. It's John Q. Barrett on Monday. Oh, oh, well, John Q. Barrett will be joining us. I'm sure we'll be talking about some combination of Justice Jackson, the history of special and independent investigations of presidents and other cool stuff. Um, that'll be 70 hours and 51 minutes from now. And until then, Kate... <laughs> We're not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to still buy axes from Amazon <laughs> and they'll get shipped right to your door and you don't have to plug them in or anything. And they do all of the hard work of saws and you they're not hackable. They only hack. It's true. So. There is an unhackable power, uh, non power tool, uh, which is the the old, you know, like hand rip saw, saw <laughs> hand <laughs> saw kind of yep. thing. It's really hard to oh, hack. Oh, the Japanese it. ones. Yeah, the Japanese, Japanese ones, ones are really cool. Hack. They they're push Speaking saws. of hazardous, <laughs> when, when so you push it, when you when you push the wood down the table saw, do you say, "No, Mister Bond, I want you to die." <laughs> I'm gonna yes. do that from now on. It is this is what's gonna happen. <laughs> there is always a like, you know, our hero is on the tracks, and you know the saw is coming for him. Thing going yeah. when you use a table saw, just yeah. always. So, yeah. Okay. So I'm. I have to say, I'm hoping I'll be reinvited for when the whole session is just on power tools or woodwork. Oh my gosh, totally we, should have, doing that. we should do that with Josh Marshall, actually, because you know Josh oh, Marshall yeah. makes all of his own hand tools, like he makes his yeah, own... Yeah, no, that's a whole next level shit. I mean, okay, wow. okay but Ben yeah. feels, this is threatening no, no, that masculinity makes me feel, in some That makes me feel really <laughs> yes. inadequate. Yes. Um, so we can't do it. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a masculinity thing. Um, it's like, it's a, I feel that way about like anybody who does something that I do I feel that way about people who write, you know, using ink and, you know, like write really well, but they do it all, you know, with pen and paper. There's just something about the sort of really OG forms of, of any art that put to shame the people who do it using all of these technological advances that... Yeah. I, you know, I have we, that feel, yeah, I have that feeling about commercially made cheese, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, don't Ouch. say that. You'll get there. I mean, you made your own, like, chev slash But you didn't grow the cow cheese. or the, no, or the I didn't. goat. Yeah, no, but I, I am grinding my own wheat, so. Yeah, so, you know, but you didn't grow it. No, but I, I did, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you.